This is section 15.1, Graphs and Level Curves. This is pretty good because having finished chapter 14, we know all about what to do with vector-valued functions, and now we can get into, we're like approaching the point of the class. In the very first news post at the beginning of the class, I showed a picture of something that I said you would understand at the end of the class, and it was called an exact sequence. Um, it was this picture here. Let me get the notes out of the way for a minute. It was this picture, like, up, up, up there. <laughs> um, so far, you don't have much of the information about what any of this stuff is. Um, we've mostly been dealing with just vectors, which were, uh, here, I got these data types up over my head. We've mostly been dealing with just vectors, and then we also dealt with curves in space and curves in the plane. Those were functions that took an input like time and outputted points in space, points in a plane, or points in space. Um, those aren't really the objects that we're dealing with in the final point of all of Calc 3. Those are just the tools we need to be able to do anything at all. We did get some payoffs in Chapter 14, but the big final like punchline of the class is this thing here. So what are we going to actually do? Well, this first. I mean, this object, this is the, the real numbers. <laughs> and we'll talk about what the arrows mean later. But this is the fancy R, just means the set of real numbers. The thing that we get to get into in chapter 15 is what is this thing? This C infinity means the uh, functions that are like, inf that the C is for continuous, but the infinity means they're continuous and they've got a continuous derivative, and then there's a continuous derivative of the derivative, and a continuous third derivative, and a conti it's infinitely many continuous derivatives. And these are functions from R3, this is space, to R. So in chapter 15, we're going to get to having functions that instead of going from r to r3, a function r to r3 this is a curve in space. Something like um, r of t is sine t cosine t 3t. This would be a helix in space that's like looping upward. That's a function that takes an input of one, one number and outputs a vector in space. The thing in chapter 15 is going to be totally different. We're going to be looking at functions that go from, the, from space to numbers, to the real numbers, or from the plane to real numbers. This will be you instead of inputting one number and getting out three coordinates, Instead, you input three numbers and get one real number out, like, I don't know, x squared, y, z, minus z to the fourth. So these functions, they both have something to do with space, and they both go between, like, numbers and space, but they're totally different objects. Um, so chapter 15 is going to get us into these kinds of objects. In the middle of chapter 15, we get to use the gradient. The gradient is super powerful and tells us how to, it'll be the first time that we run into a vector field, which is the final type of object um, that we need to like do this whole punchline of calculus at the end. Um, but yeah, so we really wanna figure out how to understand this kind of function, a function that instead of taking a time input and giving you a point, Instead, it takes a point input and gives you a value. So that's what we're aiming at. Okay, let's get back into the notes. Try to do this 15.1 notes. Um, the objectives here in 15.1 are we want to represent surfaces as a function of two variables. So that's not quite what the goal was that I told you just a minute ago. Instead, we'll have a function that has two input variables at the beginning. Then we'll want to learn how to graph functions of two variables, find the domains of functions of two variables, and then figure out how to draw them with um, level curves and contour maps. So the thing we're working on in section 15.1, we're not quite going to make it to functions from space to the real line. We'll only be doing uh, functions from the plane to the real line. 
So the input will be a point and the output will be a number. Okay, let's try to remember some stuff about uh, vector geometry from the very first chapter. So first, like, how do you write a plane? Well, a plane, that, there's lots of ways to write an equation of the, an equation for a plane. Probably the easiest one. What is going on? Oh no. I don't know what I did. <laughs> I have the wrong tool on. Okay, okay, okay. Well, that was fun. I didn't do it on purpose. Uh, the easiest equation of a plane is um, an equation that starts with zero. You get a times x minus x naught plus b times y minus y naught plus c times z minus z naught. Clearly, if... Why would I say clearly? Okay, if you plugged in x naught for x, y naught for y, and z naught for z, the equation would come out true because you'd get zero plus zero plus zero. So this is a plane that goes through the point x naught, y naught, z naught. And the trick to this ABC is that ABC is a normal vector to the plane. So if someone gives you a point and a normal vector, it doesn't have to be a unit normal vector or anything fancy like from chapter 14. Um, you can just drop them into this equation. So this is the easiest way to build the equation of a plane. Zero is, I'm gonna have two, three, minus five. That's the normal vector. And then the point is one minus two, zero. It's the equation of a plane. Remember how to write the equation, well, an equation, oh dear. There's multiple equations for any given surface. But one, one way to write the equation of a sphere, well, we wanna write that the radius is five but the radius is the distance from the center point, zero, 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 out to the outside. So it's gonna be x minus the x of the center squared, y minus the y value of the center squared, and z minus the z value of the center squared is r squared. Drop in the points for the center, and we'll get, in this case, the center is zero, zero, zero. So we'll get x squared plus y squared plus z squared is 25. Finally, a hyperbolic paraboloid. Okay, well, a hyperbolic paraboloid, it's like the equation for a hyperbola, but we've got z equals. And you need some, you need x and y to both be squared, but one positive and one negative. So something like this would work for any value, for any real values of a or b. So, um, like we can make a hyperbolic paraboloid by making this be z equals y squared over eight minus four x squared. That would work. There are a bunch of other shapes in chapter 13. Um, some of those will come back and we'll need them later. <laughs> no, I have some upside down function down here. Okay, we're going to be finding the domain of functions of two variables, but the idea is the same as when we were finding the domains of functions of one variable a long time ago, like in algebra, pre-calculus, calc 1. Um, so for this function of one variable, the domain is all the values of the input that are valid. Here, the input is the x. So the domain is all the acceptable values of the input. all the values of the input that actually give us an output. For a function of one variable, that's just what are the x's? So here, well, it starts at x equals 1 and ends at x equals 3. 
So the domain is all the numbers between 1 and 3, with a bracket here to say that 1 and 3 are both included. Um, the question didn't ask this, but the range is all the values of the output. Here, for a function of one variable, the output is the y's. So here the range would be all the numbers from 0 to 2. So if you've memorized, like if you've learned that the domain is the x's and the range is the y's, that's fine, but it's not great. Better is to say that the domain is the inputs and the range is the outputs, because if you learn it that way, then that definition keeps working in this chapter. So here we have a function of two variables. Now, what do I mean here? Well, now I'm looking in space. And instead of the input being the x and the output being the y, instead it's more like if you picked an x and a y in the xy plane, then I could tell you how high this surface is. So the input is the x's and y's, and the output is the height. It's the z's. In this way, like this thing over my head, the input is a plane. It's two variables, and the output is one number. So we're getting functions of two variables. Because the input is the x's and the y's, the domain will be all the x's and y's that give us an output. And the range will be all the outputs, which here in this case is all the z's. So please notice that the domain is not just the x's and the range is not just the y's. It's the inputs and the outputs. Here it looks like there's some kind of like a circular cap, like somebody sliced the top off of a sphere. So it looks like if we went down to the xy plane to see what shape was down here, it would probably be a circle. That anywhere in this circle, if you picked an x or a y that were in this circle, I could tell you how high this cap is. But if you picked an x and a y, like say you picked an x and a y that were out here, and you asked me how high is the cap at this x and y, I would have to say, well, it's not there. So this x and y is not in the domain. But all of this stuff is the domain. So the domain is the set of all the x's and y's that actually give us an output. My guess is that the domain is this circle. And the circle lives in the xy plane. Okay. Normally, you won't just get a picture. Normally, you get some kind of formulas. Uh, here, the question, example six, says find the domain of these functions of two variables. So here, the inputs are x and y, and the outputs we're thinking of as being the height, the z. Well, we find the domain when we're given a formula the same way that we used to find the domain when we were given a formula with only one input. So we ask, like, well, does this fraction always give us an output, or are there some values of the inputs that don't work? So find the domain is which inputs give us outputs. Some inputs might give us undefined, and I don't want those in my domain. The domain is all the ones where the output is actually defined. So uh, here, this is undefined if the denominator is 0. So it's undefined if x minus 2 equals 0. Um, that means that it's undefined if x is 2. So the domain is all the points in the plane, because the input is points in the plane. It's all the points in the plane except the ones where x equals 2. There are a lot of points where x equals 2. So it's everything except the points where x equals 2. Notice that the domain isn't made of intervals like it used to be in like an algebra or a pre-calculus class or even a calculus 1 class. Here the inputs are points in the plane. So the domain is a region in the plane. Let's look at this one. 
This is another fraction. Fractions go wrong if their denominator is zero. So this one is undefined when its denominator is zero. I can try to figure out what this would look like by solving for something. And here it's undefined when y equals x squared. So my domain is going to be everything except the points where y equals x squared. All the rest of the plane is the domain. So if I ask you, like, hey, is 2 comma 2 in the domain, that's a possible input, x is 2 and y is 2, you could look at this picture and say, oh yeah, 2, 2 looks fine, it's in the domain. Where if I asked you, is 1, 1 in the domain, well, 1, 1 satisfies y equals x squared, so the function isn't defined. So 1, 1 is not in the domain. Some things are the same as they used to be, which is, if you're looking at an algebraic expression that's always defined, then the domain is all possible numbers. But here, instead of saying the domain is all real numbers, it's the domain is all points in the plane. If you want to write it in a fancier way, you don't have to learn this notation, but here's all points x, y, here's in, and here's the plane. You can write the words in the plane or in the xy plane if you want, but this is just a fancier way to, to write it and um, it's sometimes good to be able to look fancy. Okay, in example seven, the goal is to try to graph a function of two variables. Just like how you used to graph functions of one variable, it's possible to plug in values of x and y. Just start by plugging in zero for x and zero for y, and then maybe we could plug in three comma one and plug in four comma two, but there are lots and lots of possibilities. So we don't want to use that plan if we can avoid it. If possible, we want to try to use a kind of like a more coherent plan to get an idea for what's going on. So here's the, the most like universally coherent plan that I have. The plan would be, there's gonna be some surface here, but you should see what happens if each variable equals zero. So try z equals zero try y equals zero, and try x equals zero. If you set z equals zero, then you get an equation that tells you what's happening in the xy plane. If you set y equal to zero, you get an equation that tells you what's happening in the xz plane. And if you set x to zero, you get a, an equation for what's happening with the yz plane. I'm gonna have to erase yz plane because I wanna draw over here. Eh, maybe it'll, no, it's going to turn out okay because of this minus. <laughs> um, you have kind of like years of experience graphing things that have one input variable and one output variable, so you'll recognize some patterns if you can get things to look like that. Just setting each variable to zero will let you use that knowledge you've built up over the years. So let's see it. Um, I want to see what's going on in the xy plane first. So I set set z equal to zero. z is this f of x, y. So I'll set zero equals minus square root x squared over four plus y squared over four. This is a mess. I'm gonna square both sides. When I square this minus, it turns positive. And then multiply both sides by four. So I'll get 0 is x squared plus y squared. Now x squared plus y squared equals a number is a circle. This is a circle of radius 0. Circle of radius 0 is a point. So that means in the xy plane, the only thing we have on the picture in the xy plane is the point at 0, 0. The rest of the graph is either up above the xy plane or down below the xy plane. It never hits the xy plane other than at this point. Then you can hit the xz plane. The xz plane is the one where y equals 0. 
and you actually just plug in y equals zero. You get z is minus square root x squared over four. It's hard to read, so, hmm, is it? The square root of x squared can be simplified. The square root of x squared is the absolute value of x. So I will get z is minus absolute value of x over four. Um, do you remember what absolute value of x looks like? It makes a V shape. And if you divide it by four, it just makes it like shallower and making it negative flips it upside down. So in the XZ plane, that means the places where Y is zero, we get a V shape that's downward and it's like not very steep. Then you go look at the uh, YZ plane. When you plug in x equals zero, the same thing happens. You end up with z is minus the absolute value of y over four. Okay, so in the yz plane, this is where x is zero, you also get this v shape. So the question is, what's going on around here? Um, a good guess would be that you should like connect all these with circles because I have something that kind of looks like x squared plus y squared equals z squared. Um, if you're not sure what to do, you should plug in a value of z other than zero. So this is like a good starting point, but just like when you were graphing functions forever ago, you would like plug things in until you felt like you saw the pattern. So here it looks like there's action when z is negative so I'll try z equals minus one. When I plug in z equals minus one, I get minus one equals minus this stuff. Square both sides and multiply both sides by four and I'll get four equals x squared plus y squared. So when z is minus one, a little bit below the xy plane, I get a circle with radius two. So that confirms that I should connect these lines with circles. Okay, so what is this? Um, I don't know if you can see this very well, but this is a cone. It's like a pretty flattened out cone. It's not like a super steep cone, um, but it's it's got a point at the top. If you look in any direction, it's like a V-shape, but it's like a V-shape that's been rotated around. So by plugging in points, by not plugging in points, that's exactly what we're not doing. By plugging in numbers for various variables, you can get kind of like the skeleton of what's going on. I've got like a V-shape across from another V-shape. And then when you're not sure what's going on other than that, you can just plug in any number you want for any variable. It turns out that it will be useful to plug in values of Z very often. So we'll get in, we'll like codify this and give it a name in a little bit. But for now, we've got this cone, it's pointed down, it's pretty flattened out. Let's get the domain and range. The domain is all the input values that give us valid outputs. From the picture, it looks like any X or Y will work. So it's the whole XY plane. Because of this, I mean, the square root is a little bit dangerous, but because we square x and y, um, it doesn't matter what x and y are, we'll always get an output. The range, on the other hand, the surface is always below the xy plane. So the range is all the negative numbers. Well, all the negative numbers and zero. So the range is everything from minus infinity up to zero, including zero. So just remember that the domain is the inputs and the range is the outputs. And right now the inputs are the X's and the Y's. So the domain is like a, a region in the plane and the range is the outputs, which in this case is the Z's, that's the, the Z values. Okay, let's codify this plan of like picking Z's. I think that's what's next anyway. Yeah, um, the, the plan, let's just plug in some values of Z is called level curves. So you basically, 
choose some values of z, nice ones. And you get to pick. So you pick values of z that are nice. And then when you plug in values of z, you'll get equations that have only x and y. So you plot the result in the xy plane. Level curves, if you can learn how to read them, they are the same thing as a contour map. So if you've ever seen a trail map, it's like a topographical map, it's the same thing. But level curves and contour maps are a way to see surfaces without having to actually draw them in three dimensions, which was a little bit awkward. So let's do that. Uh, we're still going to use z is minus square root x squared over 4 plus y squared over 4. And I'll put the result over here. OK, so you pick values of z, whatever you want. Um, we already know that p picking positive values of z is not going to work very well because I can't get 2 to equal the minus square root of anything. So the easiest one is z equals 0. You just plug in 0. I think this is the thing that's the most alarming to students is that you're just allowed to plug in any number you want for any variable as long as you can understand what that means. And but. If your plan is level curves, you plug in numbers for the z's. Okay, we already talked through this, that this is just the point zero, 0, because it turns out that this is equivalent to x squared plus y squared equals 0. So you go here, and when you draw, like I drew x squared plus y squared equals 0, you label it with the z value that you chose. Then you pick another z value. Now we'll try z is minus 1 plug in minus 1. When you plug in minus 1, we already saw what happens here, you get x squared plus y squared equals 4. x squared plus y squared equals 4 doesn't have any z's in it, so you can graph it in the xy plane. 1, 2, make a circle with radius 2. This is the level curve for the level z equals minus 1. So the level is the height, it's how high you are. Like if you're at level 8 of a building, that's your height. Here we picked a height, that's the level, and we got a curve. So this is the level curve. And if you just draw a bunch of level curves and you learn how to read these, you can see shapes without actually seeing in three dimensions. So without the picture being three dimensional. So let's just try another z. If z is minus 2, we get minus 2 equals the function. Square both sides, and we'll get 4 is x squared over 4 plus y squared over 4. So we get x squared plus y squared equals 16. This is a circle with radius 4. Nice circle. The circle is a curve. The level is z equals minus 2. So here's another level curve. This circle is the level curve for z equals minus 2. And let's just do one more. Uh, kind of out of colors, but if I do z equals minus 3, I plug in minus 3 for z, and I'll end up getting 9 times 4. So I'll get x squared plus y squared equals 36. That's a circle of radius 6. And that curve corresponds to the level z equals minus 3. So this is the, these are some level curves for various values of z. And the point is that if you put them all on the same picture, you get an idea for what's going on with this surface, which is that the further down you go, the further out these circles are. Altogether, if you graph a whole bunch of level curves on the same picture, that's called a contour map. So this is a contour map of a cone. OK, let's try another one. This is just another function. Um, it's a function of two variables, which means the input is a point on the plane, and the output is how high you are. So let's try some level curves. 
the easiest one is probably z equals zero. And you literally plug in zero for z, and then you see what happens. This is a curve because it, this is a curve in the xy plane because it only has x's and y's. So if I simplify it enough, I'll be able to figure out a picture for it. So I'll square both sides and then I'll add x squared plus y squared to the other side. And I'll get x squared plus y squared is 25. That's a circle with radius five. So the level curve for the level z equals zero is this circle. Then we'll pick some more levels. Um, z equals one looks bad because I'll end up with 24. I don't want 24, eh, whatever, let's just do it. Actually the best z looks like it would probably be z equals five. When you're making a contour map, you pick any z's you want. When I square both sides now, the 25s will cancel, and I'll get that 0 is x squared plus y squared. Well, we've seen this before. That's a point. This is the level curve for z equals 5. Okay, let's get some more in between. So z equals 1. When I plug in 1 for z, unfortunately I'm going to get this 24. I'll get that x squared plus y squared is the square root of 24, which is like just barely less than, this is a circle that just barely has a radius less than five. Now, I don't know if you have any experience before with contour maps, but if you see a contour map of like the real world and the contour lines are very close together, that means that it's a steep area. The steepness is something that we want to learn how to measure. Um, let's get a couple more in here. If I plug in z equals 2, so it looks like things are steeper for this, for this surface. Everything is steeper on the outside than it was for the cone. This one, I'll end up with x squared plus y squared is the square root of 21. That's like around halfway between four and five, so the level curve is still gonna be very close to the other level curves. Okay, let's get a couple more. When z is three, we will have that three is square root 25 minus x squared minus y squared and I'll end up with x squared plus y squared is 16. That's a circle with radius four. Now remember the z is the level and the x squared plus y squared equals 16 is the curve. So here's the curve. And since it's a curve that corresponds to a certain level, it's called a level curve. Uh, the last level curve that I'll draw is the one for z equals four. It turns out you get a circle with radius three. So what's the difference between these contour maps? Well, the difference is that in the first one, which is a picture of a cone, the contour lines stay equally spaced from each other, which means that the slope, like the steepness of the surface is the same everywhere. If you think about walking around on a cone, the cone is always like tilting downward the same amount, no matter where you're standing. And you can see that on a contour map by seeing contour lines that have the same spacing everywhere. The second example, the contour lines are very close together on the edges. So on the outside, it's very steep. And on the inside, the contour lines are very far apart. So it's like flattened out in the middle. So you can tell from these contour lines that this is steep on the outsides going up toward the middle, and then it's flat on the top. So this is the top half of a sphere. So this is a hemisphere. and this one is a cone. And by seeing how the contour lines interact, you can see like how close together the contour lines are, you can see what the shape is. Um, 
I think I would like to pull up a map and just show you what this looks like before we do some more. Yeah, we'll do we'll do this after we look at a map. Let's see if I have contour map. So um, here's a contour map of Elgin. The brown lines are the contour lines. So um, and the brown lines should have little numbers on them somewhere. So like I've got a little 800 up here. There's some 800s. That's elevation 800 feet. And each contour line, how far apart are they? I see an 800 and an 850. I just can't tell if the lines are every 10 or every... I think the lines are 10 feet of elevation. Yeah, because this is 800, 810, 820, 830, 840, 850. Okay, so if you go from one contour line and you walk from one contour line to another contour line, you walk, you gain or lose 10 feet of elevation. If the contour lines are spread out, that means that it's basically flat, that the, it, you have to walk a long way to go up by 10 feet. And if the contour lines are smushed close together, that means it's steep. Um, so in Elgin, I mean, over by ECC, it's super flat. There, there's some contour lines, but you have to walk a significant distance before you gain or lose 10 miles of elevation. The steep parts, like the, the kind of like, I want to say hilly, but it doesn't have to be hills. It could be cliffs also. There's apparently like serious elevation changes over here. I don't know where that is. Weldwood Drive. It's apparently like over here. Apparently this is like a steep hill. Huh, yeah. So going from east to oops, from east to west, it's sloping up really steeply. And you could tell that on the contour map because the contour lines were very close together. Um, where by ECC it's like super flat. Um where's another place that has contour lines really close together? I guess whatever this pond is. So apparently it's like really steep there. Can't really tell that from a satellite picture. Okay, if you really want to see some steep hills, you want to zoom out a little bit on a contour map. Whoa. So up here, this is a good one to look at. Um, you can't, well, I don't know, maybe you know this. Maybe you've had like a geology class or you've thought about this. When this happens, this is what it looks like when a river cuts through an area. Um, we'll, we'll go, we'll try to find it on the, on the satellite picture in a second. But first of all, the contour lines are really close together. Um, so that means it's a steep hill downward. And then down here, the contour lines are really far apart, which means it's really flat. That's the floodplain of this, whatever this creek is. Um, and then the weird indents of the of the contour lines mean that th there's like a divot in the surface of the earth there. So let's go try to see this. Even though there's no river on this picture, like there has to be a creek here. So we're looking for Sleepy Hollow Road at I-90. So on the satellite picture, it's this. Where does it look like it crosses? Maybe here? Hmm. I mean, you can see that the trees are cut up by this. Where will we be able to look at it? 
I don't know that you'll be able to see through the trees. Yeah, you can't. There's a creek back there. <laughs> oh well, I guess I don't. Well, maybe the trees are convincing enough. Um, anyway, this the apparently the reason this isn't very developed is that it's um, it's a really steep hill, um, but then you can you can see the creek that cuts through here, and then this flat land here is because of the because of I don't know how to pronounce that <laughs> this thing. <laughs> okay, so that's what the contour lines are about. Um, you can kind of start, once you get used to contour lines and contour maps and level curves, you can see the shape of a surface by just looking at its lines. Um, I don't know if there's any other interesting places around. There's no, like, mountains, really. <laughs> It looks like the steepest kind of like cliffs in the area are over here between Western Avenue and Lincoln Avenue. Let's see if we can look at that. So that's here like behind these, behind the strip mall. <laughs> I don't know if we'll be able to see that. Yeah. It's just like a hill that goes up behind there. And then we go down to the river that way. So that's what contour lines and contour maps are for. Close together, contour lines that are close together are steep surfaces. Okay, how do we do problems in here? Um, so this example 10 says, here's a contour map of a continuous function. We're trying to connect the idea that a continuous function of two variables corresponds to a surface where you plug in a point in the like an x y coordinates and it gives you the height. So here I can tell that here where the contour lines are close together, it's a steep surface, and over here where they're far apart, it's flatter. Okay, for what values of y is it true that f of five comma y is between ten and thirty? Okay, f of five comma y. If it's 5 comma y, that means that x is 5. So we're looking at points where x is 5 and y could be anything. And we want to know when the height is between 10 and 30. So here's x is 5. It's all these points. This is asking, for all the points where x is 5, when is the height between 10 and 30? Well, here's where the height is 10. And here's where the height is 30. So it's everything in between here. But then in, inside the 30 contour line, um, inside the 30 level curve, it, the height is above 30. So I don't want those points. And then here's where it's 30 again. And then back here, it drops down to 10. So the thing that, that you should be working on in your head is that the x and the y are both the input and the z is the output, the height is the output. So here, even though y is like ranging between two and 10, that's not what the question is about. The question is, when is the height between 10 and 30, which we get from the level curves? So what's the answer? Well, the answer is what values of y? So first it looks like the y's should be between like two and seven. And then the other way to get height between 10 and 30 is to start up here between like y equals 9 and y equals 11. So just figure out how to read the read what it's saying. The output f of x, y is the height, z. Okay, can you estimate f of 2, 4? Now f of 2, 4 means that x is 2 and y is 4. So we'll go 2, 4. And I want to know what the height is over here. The answer is I can't really tell what the height is out there because I don't have any more contour lines. I know that it's less than 10, but I don't know anything else. Because outside of the 10 contour line, the height is something less than 10, but I can't tell if I don't have a zero contour line, I can't really tell where I am. So I just know that it's less than 10.
but nothing uh, but nothing else then it asks what about f of 5 comma 8 so let's go look at x equals 5 y equals 8 when x is 5 and y is 8 we're here and again I don't really know what the height is but I do know that it's more than 30 now from context probably if the 10 20 and 30 lines are here if there was a 40 line it would be drawn so my guess is that the height at x equals 5 y equals 8 remember we're thinking of the height as like coming out of the like coming out of the paper at us that there's this hill that's drawn with these level curves that I think the height is more than 30 I know the height's more than 30 and I think it's probably less than 40 so my estimate is that f of 5 8 is probably we know it's less than 30 <laughs> that's not how you spell no we know f of 5 8 is above 30 and it's probably less than 40 Um, the reason is that it says explain. The reason is that 5, 8 is inside the level curve. For z equals 30. Finally, it asks for how many values of y are does f of 7 y equal 20. Okay, you have to be able to read this. If there's a 7 in that slot, that means that x is 7. So if x is 7, when does the output equal 20? Well, the output equals 20 here and here. So there's two different values of y where the output equals 20. How many values for y? Two. Um, there are approximately... I think it was y equals 4 and y equals 10. Yeah, y equals 4 and y equals 10 both give us z equals 20. And I'm kind of like, it doesn't say z, but I'm thinking of f of x, y as being the height of a surface. So I'm thinking of z equals 20. And then the level curve shows me all the places where z equals 20. Uh, that's it for 15.1. Hopefully you feel like surfaces can be thought about as functions of two variables and that you can you have like a strategy to try to draw functions of two variables. You certainly know how to use some algebra to get the domain of functions of two variables and then contour lines and level curves are something you can do with algebra and they're also something you can do with topographic maps and if you learn how to read these things then you can see surfaces just using contour maps.